this week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast? Well, the certainly the the way books are sold and marketed has changed enormously. I mean, that goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. And it means that there is that blockbuster pie is smaller. It's much smaller than it used to be. The money was funny in uh, 1996, you know, during the second Clinton administration or that when when the whole world seemed like uh, that it would be fair skies and and clear sailing for quite a while. It's it's just um, it's different now. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, sneakers, and welcome back to the podcast. If you were with us last time, you know we had some technical issues, not with the podcast, but with reeling in our guest, but that's all fine. We had a superb fill-in guest, and now I think we are back with the real deal as advertised. Jesse, can you confirm for me that we have our special writer guest on board? They are still here. So we are <laughs> it's good. A, it's a good deal. Yes. We are, of course, talking about uh, one of my favorite people and writers in the whole world, Jacqueline Michard. She has been on the podcast before, and it's a pleasure to have her back to talk about her new novel, The Good Son, which just went on sale last week. Some of you may remember she, she talked about this book when she was on the podcast before and said, I'm working on this. Maybe I'll come. Well, here she is. She'll come back. She's back. And this book is getting sensational reviews. I have never seen such an impressive list of famous authors and famous publications all saying the same thing, that this book is awesome. She has endorsements from Scott Churro and Kristen Hanna and Karen Slaughter and like 50 other people and publications. Basically, everyone you would dream of having endorse your book She's got him. But what do you expect from a longstanding New York Times bestselling author whose book, as I never get tired, she may get tired of hearing it, but I never get tired of saying her book, The Deep End of the Ocean, was the debut selection of Oprah's Book Club. We will be talking to her about her new book and her writing process and much more. But first, the news. at the end of January as we're recording this and you know we're substantially into 2022 I think it's still a time when we tend to get those year-end reports and one of the best I've seen was just released by the Alliance of Independent Authors I will put a link to the report in the show notes you can see it on the screen if you're watching the video version and I strongly recommend that anybody who thinks they might be publishing a book anytime soon take a look whether it's your first book or your 57th, I think you can benefit from all kinds of information here about book sales, ebooks versus print, audio books. But to me, one of the most important parts of the report discussed the popularity of various genes. Interesting to me because I was surprised. There's a graphic, a chart that comes out of that report. Yeah, there it is on the video version. Thanks, Jesse, that ranks all the genres in terms of the millions or in one case billions of money that these genres make well probably no surprise to anybody who's been in this biz for a while that romance slash erotica is number one by a substantial margin almost two to one over any other genre 1.44 billion next in line after a substantial step down is my world the crime and mystery and thriller department but here's what's interesting to me you see just a tiny step down from that less than 10 million 
is the inspirational market slash religious market. But, or, but you know, today people tend to call it the inspirational market because it's not necessarily one religion versus another. And there are a lot of books out there that are not so much uh, promulgating a particular religion, but are inspirational or clean. And that's what makes me wonder how they decide what book goes where. Because, for instance, there are clean romances and clean mysteries, which, you know, if it's an Amish romance, you know that it's not going to get to sexy time. But then where do you put that book? Do you put it in the romance category or the inspirational category or both? I don't know how they figured that out. But anyway, this inspirational market is growing by leaps and bounds. Take a little bit of a step down from that, and you get from, to science fiction and fant fantasy. And then, yeah, you see Jesse is waving his excited. hands. Yes. That's the Wheel of Time guys yeah, department. Yeah, we're doing good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you would think that particularly with e-books and the Internet, the, the, the computer people, science fiction readers would, uh, but, you know, can't, can't – uh, compete with the romance world and then after another substantial step down you get to the uh, horror department which i think some people would have just uh, lumped in with science fiction and fantasy i don't know jesse were you surprised by any of this well again like you i'm i would like the romance erotica category to be broken up into the romance and erotica because i really like to know which one is uh the most, because it would be funny if it was erotica. That'd just be funny. Um, <laughs> right. We do know that erotica has swelled in the ebook era, which, you know, I get. You no longer have to, you know, shamefacedly go up to the counter and try and <laughs> purchase something. Not that I would ever do that, but people who might, you know, now they can just download it and it's on. So I get that. But yeah, I don't know what the breakdown is, but romance does seem to be king queen yeah. what do you it seems to be the most popular genre overall although yeah. my librarian friends tell me that when it comes to libraries and checking out books crime and a thriller or that uh, may be the same thing that you don't want to go to the counter with your <laughs> with the spicier stuff i mean if, if you remove romance erotica from the thing it looks very much like uh money made from different uh, genres of podcasts like crime podcasts are number one right and then there's like the religious inspirational ones and there's everything else that's a good point are there not romance podcasts i mean there must be i mean there are there are podcasts that are like about relationships and about mm. romance but i don't think like there's not as far as i know there aren't like narrative romance podcasts maybe there are i don't know i've i haven't searched for them they probably exist <laughs> but i do know that true crime podcasts are still number one Right. So. Absolutely. All right. News item number two. This is more year end review kind of stuff, but of a different sort. You've heard of Gallup polls. Well, a new one claims that the average number of books read per year has fallen since 2016, fallen from 15.6 to 12.6, which is pretty substantial. And of course, when you, you know, Everything else we've seen, has, including, you know, my royalty statements, has indicated that book sales have swelled in the past two years. You almost feel gu guilty that it's like you're taking advantage of, you know, the, the fact that there's a pandemic and people are staying at home. But they did seem to be buying more books and particularly e-books. But now, they, I mean, it's not so much that fewer people are reading, that but that individually they are reading fewer books. They've gone from almost 16 to almost 13. So if book buying is up, but people are reading fewer books, I don't know. Does that make any sense to you, Jesse? Is, is this just like the bouncing from like the beginning of the lockdown pandemic when people bought a lot of books? And like they're still trying to read those. Well, so they're maybe. Less now? Although the the poll claims that it it's basically over a five year period, down mm. from 2016 to 2021. It's possible they're not catching everything. Ebooks are harder to count, and particularly if somebody has, say, a Kindle Unlimited subscription mm -hmm. or some other subscription, would that count as a sale? Maybe not. But we all know that there are a lot of a lot of people are are doing that at Amazon. So. I wonder if there are some sales out there that the Gallup poll is not catching. Yeah. It really doesn't seem to me like people are reading fewer books. No, yeah, that's, that seems off. And as, as Betsy pointed out, like, at least for me as a sci-fi fantasy reader, my books just keep getting longer. So it takes me 
a longer to read them. And so I, overall, I'm reading less per year, I guess. Do you think they're really getting longer? Or is it, you know, when you're reading an ebook, who knows how long it is? You're not holding it in your, you know what I mean? You're not holding paper. You can't see how thick it is. Well, yeah, I, I only know once I go to a bookstore and see it in its right. real form. Uh, right. Especially with like the Brandon Harrison books. I'm like, my Lord, that's a large book. <laughs> that might work to his advantage if the ebook doesn't. Maybe the price tells people how long it is. That's true. The girth doesn't. Okay. Item number three. Speaking of subscription services, ju- guess who just launched a huge one? That would be Harlequin, which is apparently significant since we now know that the romance genre is the biggest by far. Well, now for $14.99 per month, Harlequin Plus offers subscribers access to not only just books, but movies and some games. And you can choose to get an ebook bundle or a print book bundle that are that is shipped to your home every month. And then, of course, in addition to the selected bundle, subscribers can read from their extensive ebook library. Uh, and they're adding new books to that every month. And this seems to me like something that might be significant. To be fair, Harlequin has had a book club for like 50 years, and this is sort of an extension of it, which does indicate that, uh, like this survey we saw before, that there's a whole lot of shaking going on in the romance world. And if you like romances and you're interested in it and you're trying to think of, what to write about for your for your debut book red sneaker writers this might be worth giving some thought to here's the one thing i don't know yet although i'm trying to find out but so somebody gets your book through a subscription how exactly is the author paid we know that at kindle unlimited on amazon you're paid according to some uh, bizarre how many pages are accessed by the reader system because spookily Amazon has some way of knowing that. But how Harlequin Plus is going to pay its authors, I don't know. And uh, that's something we need to know before you start submitting to them, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't want the audible uh, people can return a, the book a year later. Problem. Right, right. So. They're still dealing with the whole autogate or <laughs> yeah. they or whatever people are talking about. But but apparently that uh, KU subscriptions do make money for people one way or another. All right, let's move on. To me, one sure sign that people are still reading and will continue to do so is the continuing success of our guest the New York Times bestselling writer and one of the nicest people I know, Jacqueline Michard. Jesse, can you please bring on our very special guest? I want to see her and know. Yes, there she is. (laughs) You're there. Hey, Jackie, how you doing? Oh, no, she's muted now. Uh, Unmute yourself, Jackie. Is she muted on your end? or She, She is not muted on my end. Uh, do, 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 oh, okay. Do. There we go. Uh, there we there, go. There. Oh, like, you, almost me, you almost gave me a heart attack. Oh. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. This has been, I, I kept thinking that we were technologically doomed and that we were going to have to go away again, but I'm glad we didn't. So. We could have dealt, you know, I would have interviewed my cat and then we'd have brought you back next right, time. But right. <laughs> one way or another. Yeah, on about that cat. I, <laughs> I noticed that in your newsletter the other day about see a great cat that's like, I don't know. A jumbo shrimp, right? Uh, yeah. No, you don't like person. cats? Are you no, a dog I person? No, I don't. I'm sorry. I think that the, maybe they don't, probably they don't like me. I don't know that. But I love dogs. And mm. now you have dogs too, right? I do. Dogs we have both. Cats, but horses. just between us, the dogs are kind of more Laura's and the cat I adopted. I was gardening in the front yard one day, and he came up and informed me that we were going to have a new I animal in the house. Together. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I was going to adopt him, and that's exactly what happened, as it turned out. All right. We got this fabulous new book from you out just last week that is doing terrifically well. Tell us about it. Tell us about The Good Son. What should I say? It is in that second uh, sort of category. It it sort of has to do with a crime. Um, Scott Turow, you mentioned him earlier, said mm-hmm. that it sounded like it, it's sort of a, a mashup of a 
uh, domestic drama and that morphs into a true crime thriller. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about a woman who is tasked with the unenviable job of helping her college age son come back to the to his community and his home after serving time for his role in the death of the girl he loved. And uh, the community doesn't want him. And there's all kinds of protests and uh, about dating violence and other things that attend Stefan's return. But also there's a social media sort of component in this story in that um, the, uh, the, the boy is being pursued by someone who wishes him ill. Mm -hmm. uh, and sending texts to him and his mother. Now I'm going to obsess about my hair. <laughs> Are you going to do that too, Bill? No, this is, well, <laughs> uh, it's hard when you don't have hair really, but this is why I wear the hat. See, that yeah, plus the you know, aren't earphones. Yeah. <laughs> Try to look at myself as little as possible. So it sounds like you're almost crossing all the genres. I know this is serious fiction, but uh, you've got a lot of crime. Is there any romance? Because if, if you've got is. that, you got it all. There is. It, um, it, it asks in, near the end of the book, and there's, it's not really realized in the book, but it sort of asks the question, who would ever fall in love with a kid like that? Right, right. Uh, other than the kind of people who would fall in love with a kid like that, who you, you know, you don't want. You don't want. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So I, I see in the notes you mentioned that the not ex Harlequin, this book is not a romance, but you're in the same family. Your publisher is in the same publishing group, right? Yeah, Harper Collins and right. uh, um, is the sort of umbrella parent of those guys uh, these days. Right, and uh that's working out well right well <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's horrible no, it's that would be so unusual for if, if you were to say that where where did the idea for this book come from it happened in real life and i met the person to whom it happened mm. uh in the coffee line i was waiting for i was at a big writers conference a few years ago maybe seven or eight years ago, and I was about to give a speech. And I, the woman in front of me dropped her book. She was reading, I remember she was reading a, one of Anita DeMont's books, and mm -hmm. I picked it up and handed it to her. I said, are you here for the writer's conference? She said, no, I'm here to see my son. I come every weekend to see him. He's in prison nearby. He was only 20, and she said he would be in prison for a very long time because he uh, had killed the old loved and uh, they had been sweethearts since seventh grade. And he was so messed up um, from on methamphetamines that he didn't even have any memory of the crime. Mm -hmm. And uh, she further said, and this scene shows up in a sense in the uh, novel that she went to the, cemetery to put roses on the girl's grave and the girl's mother showed up and the boy's mother was terrified and they uh, but they ended up crying in each other's arms they had been neighbors at one point and the mother of the girl said you're luckier because at least you can still touch him mm -hmm. and i couldn't turn away from her bill the woman in the at the in the coffee shop right i sat there they were introducing me my when I came running down the aisle because I just couldn't walk away from her. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling somehow that she had never really told that story to anyone in that way before, mm -hmm. that there had never been someone who was a listening ear for that story. And when I told my agent I wanted to write a novel about it, his reaction was, he said, I have one word for this. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a harsh word. <laughs> and I, I, he said, there's no way you could make those people sympathetic uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, or it, in any way, um, the kind of people who you would want to root for. Right. But I, I, they were already sympathetic to me. They mm -hmm. were already in the sort of the majesty mm -hmm. of their tragedy was, uh, sympathetic to me. You know, you touch on what 
I think a lot of writers, both experienced and starting, deal with, you know, is my character sympathetic? Do they have to be sympathetic? Uh, People want to have a character arc, which presumably means they are not perfect people at the beginning of the book. But will that be so off-putting that people won't read the book? And you have a lot of unsympathetic characters in this book. How did you approach it? Well, there's a sympathetic means to me necessary might mean likable or mm-hmm. fun or something like that. And certainly that's not true. None of these characters, <clears throat> at least at the outset, is like that. Uh, but then again, in the deep end of the ocean, the the right. the protagonist character, the mother of the child who was abducted, she was no day at the beach either. <laughs> and right. yet people I think what people really mean when they say sympathetic is in the classic sense of sympathy. You know, can you care about them? Right, right. Can you care about what happens to them? Mm -hmm. And I'm fairly certain that there's nobody who would read this story who does, who would be um, immune to caring about what happens to Thea or to Stefan. Right. I mean, there's a door in there because even in the face of tragedy, you can empathize if not, even when people aren't perfect, which in real life uh, people aren't ever, but (laughs) maybe we expect more from our protagonists. I don't know. Well, I've, I've often heard that. I mean, Mm -hmm. I've often heard that in regard, uh, uh, in relationship to the characters in my books, that they are Mm -hmm. flawed, Mm -hmm. that, why isn't she kind all the time? Or why didn't she respond to this in a different way? Or why is she being selfish? And to me, that's because they're being real. They're authentic. Human beings. Yeah, human beings. You've mentioned mothers a couple of times now. And in fact, I just got to point out your books have frequently featured mothers in difficult, facing the unimaginable or things that nobody wants to imagine in their own life. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the truth of the thing is the truth of our world is that when something bad happens in a family, Mm -hmm. oftentimes the blame for that is laid at Mm. the foot of the parents. Right. And most often the mother. Right. Because somehow it seems that the mother is supposed to be sort of the the main instructor, the last bastion of mm-hmm. civility right. or uh, or truth or right. upbringing. And in, in charge of the kids, yeah. stereotypically. So. What? And in charge of the children, stereotypically. So Stereotypically yeah. and also in some ways, in fact, it's a rare family in which there is a in which the mother isn't sort of the cleanup hitter in, uh, (laughs) in domestic life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's why also, because I'm a mother myself there, it's interesting to readers. And I've been surprised how many guys have read this book and written to me and said that they've read it known men, Mm. um, that it, it's a, a sort of a riddle that, I heard a speech, a TED talk by yeah. Sue Klebold. Okay. Dylan Klebold's mother. Okay. And uh, he was one of the Columbine shooters. Right. And I think I know the talk you're talking about, but go ahead, please. It was mesmerizing hmm. and she was eloquent. And one of the things she said that I think really shocked people is that despite the grief and the guilt that she feels and the blame that is laid at her doorstep, less so her husband than her Hmm. didn't you know and all that that she still loves her child and i guess that and wishes he was alive and that i guess is the takeaway for this book is that there is no love so intransigent as a parent's love Hmm. you know jesse was mentioning a minute ago that true crime is very popular or crime but also in podcasting and elsewhere true crime this book involves crime, as many of yours has, 
have. You just mentioned that it's based upon <laughs> a true incident, or at least is inspired by one. What do you think's the appeal? What are what what is it people are reading or tuning in for? Furthermore, Bill, yes, Jesse, seventy-seven percent of the people who read true crime and listen to, and an even larger number of people who listen to true crime podcasts are women Hmm. and who do them. And I think for women anyway, it's because while men are overwhelmingly the um, more often the victim of homicides, uh, women are more often the victim of every other kind of crime, you know, assault Hmm. and abuse and things like that. And I think that they are fascinated by the kind, the possibility of the kind of mind who would do something like that. Hmm. Um, They want to, in a sense, know their enemy. I certainly know that's true in the mystery thriller. And, you know, once upon a time, when I started anyway, in the 90s, I'm not sure everybody recognized that more and more, particularly in the hardcover world, I would hear people saying, don't do that, or cut down on the humor because most of your readers are going to be men and men don't like, and that turns out to not be true at all. I don't care what you're talking about. At least 70% of the readers are going to be female. Then that's true. And they buy most of the books, whether they're for men or for women. Right. Right. Men read the preponderance of history and war Hmm. novels and uh, (laughs) and women are sort of on the waterfront in a lot of the rest of it. Yeah, I think that's right. And probably uh, not. uh, I I mean, what I'm saying, trying to say is I think they, people use the same cliche in the science fiction world, don't they, Jesse? Uh, But I know many, many women are reading there too. I I posted in the uh, chat the hilarious SNL sketch about uh, women's obsession with murder shows and murder podcasts as like, oh, a, really? as, as an activity they do like when their boyfriends or husbands like go out for the night and it's very funny you should all watch it I can't wait to uh, watch that I've it never was, seen that how could I have missed yeah. it uh, I, I, it's, I think it's about a year old maybe uh, but it's very it's very funny and appropriate I feel so. While I look at these chat notes, it reminds me that uh, we have some people watching. And if anybody's got a question they want to put to Jacqueline Machard, holy smokes, this is your opportunity. So type it into the chat box and we'll ask her. You mentioned that you are a mother yourself. Uh, how, uh, what size is your family now? Cause I oh, think that's it's, a it's, joke. <laughs> that's a trick question. Everybody <laughs> knows it's a trick question. Uh, I have nine children, Bill, that I know smokes. of through birth and adoption. All my daughters were adopted and I, um, and you know, you have a lot of kids. I do. It doesn't seem as win. many <laughs> as, as it seems to people outside that. Right. You know, a big family has its own way of functioning. Mm-hmm. If it's at all, I mean, if it's at all working. Mm-hmm. I remember when I grew up on the west side of Chicago, there were the police, the policemen and the firemen. And those were for different reasons who had 12 kids or 13 kids. <laughs> and, and the mom was gone. I mean, she was just, you know, staring in the backyard. And, uh, but these are a different kind of family. These are intentional families. Right. You chose it. Yes. And I, I still have, I have three kids still in high school and a couple kids in college and I will never, I like the hustle bustle. Mm -hmm. I like the, you know, my life is solitary otherwise without them. And you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I don't know exactly how I feel like family is best. I don't, and regardless of the origins, which I hardly even remember <laughs> at some point, <laughs> just I, wonderful I know. children. I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And good because otherwise I'm sitting at home and typing and occasionally reading and thank goodness for family to have somebody to care about and feel that it's returned. Right. And sh- it just shake you up too. Yeah, that too. I don't know. I don't know how my <laughs> friends. I have lots of friends who, at my advanced age, you know, uh, looking down the 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 lens of being a senior citizen, 
um, that are, uh, they've been on their own for years and they basically, they get up when they want and they eat when they want and they're not accountable to anybody else. And I think of that as just horrible. No, right, right. I don't want that at all. No, that's, that, that really is when you've retired too much. Uh, but writers don't have to retire and uh, still, as long as I can spell, I don't actually, even after I can spell, because right. now you can dictate, right? <laughs> right. And I know a lot of people who do that too. I could never do it, but I know a lot of people, a lot of writers, good writers who do. You really think you couldn't? I mean, I know it's not your first choice, but say, you know, you couldn't type anymore. Don't you think you'd try dictating? Maybe, you know, I noticed today, and just as I was saying that, I, in my mind, I was having a little argument with myself because I was walking around uh, doing, making something or making dinner or something like that and thinking and then rethinking and then rethinking the first sentence of my book that I'm just starting now. Mm -hmm. And because I have to get that right before I can go into any other sentences. Oh, really? Write, oh, wow. Oh, oh, I write my books in sequence. Mm-hmm the way you read them. And I, uh, and I can't go on until the paragraph is completed to the next paragraph. And that works for you. Cause I think I'd still be on the first paragraph on the first page waiting for that sentence. <laughs> I, um, I don't know anybody else who does it this way, except mm. for me. I mean, you know, a lot of writers, I don't know anyone else whose process is, uh, the same as mine in that regard. Hmm. I mean, many times I'll type something and think, yeah, that's not great, but whatever, I'm going to move on. I'll come maybe tomorrow. The uh, inspiration will strike, but uh, not you, huh? You're there until no, it I happens. Go sleep, I go to sleep with things imperfect mm -hmm. and unfinished and then come back to them, of course. But I would never <laughs> move on to like scenes later in a book or write uh part of the middle uh before i i think of it as almost penitential wow. in the sense that i have to do uh i have to do the middle and make the middle engaging before i l allow myself the pleasure of the of what my my now a uh, thirty-year-old son used to call the slimax. <laughs> the slimax is yeah. that a portmanteau of slime and climax? Or no, what? I think it's just the soft C. He was just <laughs> pronouncing the soft C. Okay, you remind me. There's a passage in one of my favorite books, John Gardner's Art of Fiction, where he talks about uh, like the only time he had writer's block, he was writing this book and he got to a scene and somebody offered one of his female characters wine and he wasn't sure if she would take it or not. And he was stopped for like two weeks because he couldn't go on till he'd figured out whether Susie would take wine. And then one morning he thought, well, of course she would and got on with the book. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. No, mine, mine would be more in the nature of you know, is she going to be eaten by an alligator or not, or something? You know, it wouldn't be over uh, niceties. Something more important. Well, I don't, didn't say that. So I sort of said that. <laughs> you know, you have been in this business for a while, not trying to date or anything like that. But then again, I've already gave away the date of your first book, The Deep End of the right. Ocean, I think. So forget right. that. You've been at this for a while. You've been through a lot of the trials and travails, some of which are inherent in anybody who wants to be a writer or an artist, and some of which are not. But at any rate, you've survived, and here you are with a fabulous, acclaimed new book. What are some of the things you've learned along the way? Well... If I, if eh, I, I have had, uh, as my brother says, lots of luck, but both kinds. Oh, okay. that's such a good answer. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, yeah, meteoric success and then meteoric, uh, what would I call it? 
um, devastation, financial devastation, when right. my poor husband, who thinks everyone in the world is as lovely as he is, a uh, trusted uh, criminal with all our money, and that was all gone. We lost our home and everything. This is nine years ago now. And uh, and coming back from those kinds of things, well, you know, when I started writing The Deep End of the Ocean, I had just been widowed, and I had three mm. little kids. So I knew what it was like to struggle your way back to the light, and writing helps you do that, just like reading helps you do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it takes you out of your self and focuses you on another soul. Right. Who may also well, be having problems, but different ones. <laughs> different ones. Different yes. ones. And maybe they're something that you can understand, but also there is a, there is a, it's not Schoenfreude. It's, it's, but there's a sense of sharing. Yeah. When you read mm -hmm. about other people's problems, mm -hmm. when you write about difficult subjects, there is a sense of sharing that we're we're all alone in this, but we're alone together in this. Yeah, maybe not alone totally I anymore in the, in the sharing that you describe and the sense that you know, I've I've read the book, so I've conquered these problems, which actually weren't mine, but it feels like it, and that's a good feeling, right? Yeah, yeah. You have also been around long enough to see the book business change quite dramatically. How would you do it? What are the big changes as you see from now and when Deep Into the Ocean came out? Well, the certainly the, the way books are sold and marketed has changed enormously. I mean, that goes without saying, but I'll yep. say it anyway. And it means that there is that blockbuster pie is smaller. It's much oh, yeah. smaller than it used mm -hmm. to be. The money was funny in uh, 1996, you know, during the second Clinton administration or that when, when the whole world seemed like uh, that it would be fair skies and, and clear sailing for quite a while. It's, it's just, um, it's different now. And, but but those people who there are fewer of those big breakout books than there used to be. And they're in mm -hmm. different kinds of configurations. Right. But I think that if the, the demise of the novel has been predicted since the turn of the century, at least yeah. century, and it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. I mean, people are still, I believe reading uh, reading novels, reading dramatic fiction of all kinds, and some like uh, Jesse's uh, favorite genre, uh, fantasy has uh, blown people right. away. Skyrocketed, yeah, much, much more respectability than when I was a kid. Yeah, gonna... my, men my mentor was a science fiction writer. Re who was that? His was called Ray Bradbury. Oh yeah, and, I heard the name. Um, yeah, <laughs> he what he said to me a hundred years ago that the most important thing about fantasy and mm -hmm. science fiction were the human emotions involved. Mm, so right. didn't matter whether it was on Mars. Picture of me meeting Bradbury right over there with a sweet Christmas letter. I I would turn the camera and show you, but I'm afraid I'd mess everything up. So I'm not going to <laughs> fabulous mentor. I would say I'm going to turn to, in. yeah, I'm going to turn to some of the questions now that are coming in on the chat. Uh, Betsy wants to know, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started writing? Got an answer for that? I do. Um, I would be more patient with my pros. Hmm. than I was at the beginning. I felt as though the very demons were pursuing me. And I would sometimes not take, um, uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor said, take time to notice, just take time to notice. And I don't think that I did that enough hmm. as a new writer. And I'm doing it now. I slow down in my descriptions. I slow down in my thoughts about characters uh, in a way that I didn't before. 
That makes a lot of sense. Is that because you were so anxious to, you know, get published and see your name on the spine or just because you were in a race or deadlines or? No, at the time that I started my first novel, I was eager to see if I could finish it because it was an impossibility. I'd never done any creative writing, Bill. Oh, not wow. since, never written a short story, not since, well, the freshman elective at the University of Illinois in Champaign. <laughs> and I'd never had anything published. And I was eager to see if I could do something like that. Hmm. And I had no idea it was going to turn out to be a big hit or anything. Uh, by the end of it, I knew that it would get published. I mean, I knew it was good enough to get published. But there were, you know, the deep end of the ocean sold over 3 million copies, but it didn't get only great reviews. Oh, Some really? people said, what is this? You know, I mean, it wasn't, you look at a big book, like my great friend, Karen Dion's the Marsh King's daughter. Didn't, you know, some people said, is this a book about, you know, things you cook in the wilderness? <laughs> I, it, it, I mean, really? So you can't always, I read all my bad reviews. Really? Um, Even and still? I learned something. What? Oh, yes. Really? And I learn things from them. Hmm. I still learn things from them. Most of the things that are in good reviews, I already knew that I did. Hmm. But in bad reviews, there's always something useful that I can pay attention to the next time. Well, that's interesting. What a positive attitude. I think I read and got angry with the bad reviews early on. And now I just, <laughs> you've got well, a better I, attitude. I, I, no, I mean, that's after I cry and call them, you know, <laughs> right. call into question the activities of their parents and stuff like that. <laughs> right. All right. Another question. This one's from Karen, who wants to know, what do you read? Oh, everything, everything. I, um, all the fiction and lots of nonfiction as well. <clears throat> I read all kinds of biographies. I'm particularly interested in reading books that uh, are about Victorian crime, yeah. uh, which seemed like a sort of special kind of crime. And, <laughs> a and classier a, a, crime. A, a, a close <laughs> and personal. And, um, and lots of uh, history of uh, war. I read, I do read military history um, because it's interesting to me. I mm. wonder why people have wars. Uh, and um, I guess it's just in human nature. And I also, but I, re, um, in fiction, I read all my pals, um, you know, Ann Patchett and Lisa Genova and uh, Elizabeth Stroud, whatever she's writing, I'm going to read it. Uh, all kinds of what you would call uh, domestic fiction, or and and I love mysteries. I read Denise Mina mm -hmm. and uh, and other uh, women who are Sophie Hanna who are writing mystery and have a good time, a great time with that. As well right. as well, Charlie Finch. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, these are stories that I love because they have an almost mathematical quality that I. Uh, they're like music. In the way sense, it works out in the yeah, end, yeah, and the, yeah. the patterns and right. Mm -hmm. That's what I always tell people when they rebel against any form of structure, even in uh, genre fiction, uh, you know, music has structure. And why would you think writing would be any different? Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Another question. This one's from Sharon. Any advice for new authors? <laughs> Take well, your time. I do. <laughs> I have one piece of very good advice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Complete what you start. Mm -hmm. I have, if you have a good idea and you get to a certain place in it, if I have one MFA student, I have had 20 or 30 who said, Oh, I've started uh, six novels and there, none of them is completed. Mm -hmm. I just can't get past the X, Y, Z whatever it happens to be. And the, the, the whole trick of art is forcing yourself past that right. point of doubt and fear. And even if you do it badly, you can always fix it. 
you can just push through to the end because most people have some at least gauzy or dim idea of what the end of a story is going to be. But the middle is hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard for, it was hard for uh, uh, the Brontes when they were writing. That was hard for them too. It was hard Mm -hmm. for Nathaniel Hawthorne and it's still hard. So I would say finish what you start is the get hung up on completion. (laughs) Sounds like good advice. I noticed, you mentioned marketing just a minute ago. I noticed that you've just launched a new newsletter because it's popping up in my inbox. Uh, how Are you trying to get more involved in marketing? Where'd that come from? I am trying to get more involved in marketing as all writers need to nowadays, right. except maybe you. Uh, but, no, um, wrong. It, but, <laughs> but I believe that it is also kind of fun the Mm -hmm. my the newsletter for me is not really it's not really news it's just sort of me blabbing about whatever (laughs) i think is interesting at that time i have one coming up on on cats and what cats really think about people Mm -hmm. um but i i've written i write about all kinds of stuff that i find interesting in the world and um and as a result it's different from it's different from other newsletters in that it's not at all political right? Good. or not at all. I mean, it's just more sort of observational, um, sometimes humorous, sometimes poignant. Well, I've read these newsletters and I think they're wonderful, but uh, there's not a but. Let's say and every time I read one and I think that's so well written. I mean, that would have taken me all day and that would be a day that I didn't write the next chapter of my novel. So how do you balance the two? Well, it doesn't take me that long. I mean, I was a newspaper columnist for hundreds of Mm. years. And so writing one of those, the gasp newsletters probably takes me at the outside a couple of hours or maybe an hour. And I, I think of that as money well spent or time well spent time because well spent, right. it, it, it does. I I'm so interested to hear the bounce back from people. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they're saying, I made that risotto <laughs> that you <laughs> that you gave me the recipe before. And sometimes right. they're saying, uh, I've thought that about that writer, uh, you know, that particular fella, uh, too. And so it's, um, it's lots of different things, lots of different mm-hmm. responses that are interesting. That's fun. I mean, we, we all have to market, but it, isn't it nice that we can do so much now without going anywhere, without getting on an airplane or sitting for several hours in a bookstore or not that I dislike I bookstores, it. but you know what I'm saying? I love it. You love, it's, yeah. I love not going. Right, right. I, and that is heresy. You know, it's like I sell my books on Amazon, too. Oh, well, Mm -hmm. you know, and I love independent bookstores. But equally, I love uh, the big um, the big groups and the big chains. It's Mm -hmm. it's not an either or thing. No, I know uh, that book tours were it was hit or miss. Sometimes you'd 50 people would show up and sometimes two people would show up, one of whom had won the contest for uh, having the real person's name in the book. And the other guy <laughs> was a guy who, you know, was homeless and just wanted to eat all the cookies, you know, which he was welcome to. Whereas every time you send out that newsletter, you reach more people than are probably ever going to come to a book signing, right? So that's absolutely that. true. And so, that's one of the things that technology has um gifted us with can we answer sharon about how do we subscribe to the newsletter? please do that's where i was going okay you go to oddly enough my website which is called (laughs) www.jacquelinemachard.com and then there's a little tab there to subscribe to the gasp and on the home page for it right on the home page yeah you just go up to it and that means you have to spell jacqueline correctly people so (laughs) I'm going to put it in the chat so anyone who's watching now can just click on that link. Well, I mean, for that matter, you've got to 
Thank spell you. Mitch Machard right too. But that's, right. Why, that's why I Googled right. it first, and then <laughs> it was the first one up, and then I clicked on it. <laughs> so what's next? Newsletters? Are you active on social media? Are you dealing with that? I absolutely am. I uh, not as um, the the most gifted author on social media. I'll tell you right now is the my gifted pal Rebecca Mackay. Really. Um, she is an animal. Hmm. I mean, she has a writing tip every day and a writing Smoke. prompt every day. I couldn't think of a writing prompt every day for, she said she's going to do it for every day for a month. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly do that. But she also, she is like, she is a Twitter genius. Hmm. And I don't know how that translates into sales for her books. She's also one of the most gifted writers mm -hmm. I've ever known. R the writer uh, who wrote The Great Believer, The Great Believers, which was shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize and every other prize in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, uh, yeah, I try to be active. I put little essays on Facebook. I try to be active on Twitter. I think of it, Bill, you know, like, this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. Right. Because <laughs> I am such a recluse. Mm -hmm. I am inside this house. My kids say you don't have as many wrinkles as other people because you haven't been outside willingly in 20 years. <laughs> and that is true. I'm not an outdoors woman. I live by the seaside here. Uh, and I hate the ocean. Mm. I hate the sand. I... um. I just, you know, I'm an indoor cat, as they say. If you would like, we can switch houses because I love the ocean and you are never going to find one in Oklahoma, I guarantee nope. it. <laughs> nope. Um, I, uh, I don't quite know how we ended up here, but Cape Cod is surrounded by water on three sides. And I'm like the guy in Jaws who says, it's only an island if you're looking at it from the water. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So if I counted this up correctly today, uh, you've written nine adult novels, for want of a better word, uh, four for kids, six young adult books. That's pretty diverse. H how do all these differ in your mind? I mean, are you using, are you telling different kinds of stories? Are you using a different vocabulary? What sets them apart? Well, the children's books were sort of poems and, uh, and that is a stage that I haven't been in for a while. And the young adult books, uh, again, that was when I was, I used to be the uh, editor of a young adult imprint under the ages of Simon and Schuster. And I got very interested in that genre mm -hmm. and at that time. Right. And it, it's, an, it's a magnificent place to take big risks as a writer. Now I'm mostly focused on my adult right adult, adult fiction, mm -hmm. and I think I will be for the for the near future. I um, I just had the craziest, most mayhem filled idea for a book, and I wrote to my agent and said, "I want to write something really crazy, really high concept," and. I thought he's never going to write back, but he wrote back right away and said, I love this. I love this. I love this. Um, but it really, it's crazy. Well, that's, I mean, the last time he said no, but you wrote it anyway. So I'm not sure. <laughs> well, that was sort of going to be my next question to, cause I can see we need to wrap this up. What's next. Is it this crazy madcap novel you're teasing us about? No, it's a, it's, uh, crazy, but it's a story about, well, it begins, and this is not uh, giving anything away because you learn this in the first three pages. A woman who is an acclaimed photographer comes home to her house, which her, where she grew up on Cape Cod, to see her widowed father, mm -hmm. who's 60 years old. She's about 28, 27 or 28. And she learns when she gets there that he is about to marry her best friend, who's also like 28. Uh, there's a premise for you. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Jackie, thanks so much for being on the podcast again. Will you come back sometime? Write something I so we have some excuse. <laughs> 
<laughs> I absolutely will. Thank you so much for your diligence in getting me on here. Thank you, Jesse. Right. You're very um, welcome. And good luck with The Good Son. It's a terrific book. I appreciate it. Take care, guys. You too. All right, everyone. A few parting words. This is the first time I have mentioned this anywhere, but our annual Writers' Conference, WriterCon, has just uploaded its new updated website, all fresh for 2022. And with a new URL, we are now at writercon.com. That's W-R-I-T-E-R-C-O-N dot. C-O-M, although the old URL should still work, but, you know, I went to a lot of trouble to get that new one, so use it already. <laughs> this year, the conference takes place in Oklahoma City over Labor Day weekend, like in the previous years, but this year, that's September 2nd through 5th. Our headline guests include New York Times bestselling novelist Robert Dagoni and US, former U.S. Poet Laureate Billy Collins, often said to be the most popular poet in the United States, maybe the most popular since Robert Frost, and a bunch more wonderful people. We have all the familiar features and some new ones designed to help you take your writing career to the next level. So please check it out. Right now, if you register, you can take advantage of the early bird price, which will not be there forever. So please go visit writercon.com all right until next time sneakers keep writing and remember you cannot fail if you refuse to quit see you next time <laughs>